Thank you. I'm uh, pleased to be here. It's my first uh, Farming Smarter uh, conference. So today we're going to take a bit of time to talk about fertilizers and particularly enhanced efficiency fertilizers and to discuss with you some of the research that we've been doing in Manitoba with uh, these products. So I'm hoping that we're going to have a, a good healthy amount of time to be able to field some questions because I'm not going to be able to cover all our research or all the topics I would like to talk to you about but however you may have some questions that I hope we can um, take care of. All right, so first step is uh, the nitrogen cycle. It's a gorgeous thing. It's beautiful in terms of um, all the intricacies and transformations at play here, where we have inputs of nitrogen, such as fertilizers relying on our crop fields, your crop fields. And then there are a number of places or avenues that that nitrogen can go. Of course, we want to get it into the crop and into grain if we're growing uh, gr grain crops. But there are other areas as well that it can go, but we're going to need some help from biology, the biology of the soil. Okay? In particular, most of our fertilizer that we add is in the urea form, and then that needs to be converted to other forms of nitrogen. And what this uh, diagram is depicting is showing that green dotted arrow from fertilizer going to a product called ammonium, and then that moving to something called nitrate. And it's really that one depicted by that uh, big white arrow that the plants or crops take up the most of. So we're very dependent on this cycling and this transformations okay, of our nitrogen that we add. So that's fine and dandy. But there's a problem, and the problem is that um, it's, we get prone to losing nitrogen um, during these processes. So two processes here. Uh, one is through uh, erosion and runoff that generally uh, occurs more in uh, hilly landscapes, um, or the prairie pothole region, for example, uh, where we have some topography. And then another being where we have a decent amount of excess moisture that the crops aren't taking up all of the rainfall and snow melt. And then we have excess that can go down and leach. So not as much of a problem in this area, except for potentially maybe in, in some irrigated areas, potentially. More of an issue towards um, the east of the prairies where, where I'm from. But we have clay soils in that far east that um, doesn't cause a problem. So I'm not going to talk about these two particular uh, types of losses, but it's these three in particular I want to talk about. The first one is when that urea gets transformed, it turns into um, basically ammonia, and it's, which is uh, synonymous with uh, ammonium, basically. And it's this ammonia that can come off as a gas. You know it, you know the smell of ammonia. So it's very prone as it's temperature is warmer, the greater the wind, and depending on the, uh, the drier, uh, sorry, the, um, the what, uh, let me get this straight now, the wetter the atmosphere, then they're going to have more ammonia uh, being driven off from the soil into the atmosphere. This can be quite considerable of an issue, and it becomes an issue when we place our fertilizer at the surface. So it's something that we, we often do, and uh, um, it's something that can, we can lose uh, a few pounds, even in some cases tens of pounds of nitrogen as ammonia when left at the surface, okay? And there are different conditions. If we don't get a, a good rainfall to soak it into the ground, then we can, we can get into problems. So this is gonna be one process that we're gonna tackle today. The other is, another is uh, nitrification, where this ammonium will be converted by bacteria to nitrate. So we really need this process so that our crops can get the, the nitrate nutrition. Nitrate is mobile in soil, it's um, soluble in water as a, your crops transpire and take up water. They're going to be pulling nitrate through the soil and into them. So they're really dependent on having this nitrate. But this process has problems with it. One of them is that it makes nitrate extremely uh, available fast, faster often than our plants 
um, need nitrogen, particularly early on in the season. Nitrification, if the temperatures are fairly warm, nitrification will be fast, nitrate will show up, our crops are still emerging, and so forth. We haven't had um, uh, good stands, a canopy uh, formed yet, and demand isn't great. That nitrogen can be sitting around and can be lost through leaching. Another area that it can be lost to as, is as N2O, nitrous oxide. And you've probably heard of N2O, nitrous oxide. You hear a lot of it in the media, right? We get our fingers pointed at us because we're the biggest producer of nitrous oxide um, um, uh, as agriculture in general. And uh, the nitrous oxide is a greenhouse gas, a very, very potent greenhouse gas. So uh, we're trying, um, or there is interest in reducing those uh, emissions. Now, this N2O is not a big agronomic concern for you. You may be losing one, two, three pounds. We've seen at most maybe seven pounds of nitrogen coming off on a clay soil in the Red River Valley that's pretty wet and warm. Okay? It's not going to be a major agronomic thing, but it is a huge environmental issue okay, that we're um, needing to address if we want to or, or not. Okay? It's something that we're facing. And the other is denitrification, where this nitrate, if it's sitting around and the plants aren't taking it up, especially if we get a good rainfall um, during the growing season, which doesn't seem to be happening in the past couple of years, but under warm, wet condition, that nitrate can be denitrified. Okay? I know I'm giving you all these words of volatilization, nitrification, denitrification. Sounds like school, huh? But denitrification is the nitrate can go off again as this gas of nitrous oxide, but then also as nitrogen gas. And this now is a major issue because you can be losing tens of pounds of nitrogen from a field in denitrification. We could lose it in the fall. We can lose some of it in, in overwinter. Work has been shown in that uh, in southern Alberta, actually. And um, then we could lose it in the springtime as well. So uh, fertilizers and fertilizer management, we can control these three losses, or I wouldn't say control them, but let's say we can change them, we can limit them, we can temper them, okay? And that's what we're gonna be continuing on here about. And so enhanced efficiency fertilizers, okay? That's our topic. And uh, you've probably, who here has, thinks they have used and purchased enhanced efficiency fertilizers on their fields for nitrogen? Okay, there's a few hands up, okay. So what is an enhanced efficiency fertilizer? It's a fertilizer by formulation that improves the uptake of the nutrient or nutrients contained in that fertilizer by plants, okay? So there's some advantage to the plant in you taking up that form or using that formulation, that product that is sold, okay? Now, how is that? Well, it could be that the formulation reduces losses of the nutrients to the environment, so loss of nitrogen as volatilization, denitrification, or nitrification. It may alter the timing and availability of the nutrients so that the, the nitrate shows up when the crop needs it. Not, not so much before, but when the crop needs it, so that way you're kind of spoon feeding or metering out the nitrogen to the plant as it needs it. Therefore, it's less prone to losses. Okay. And the other is, in some cases, some formulations are touted to um, be easier for the plant to take up. I'm not going to be discussing any of those types of formulations uh, today. Okay, I'm going to be talking more about the ones that affect the losses and the timing of availability. Okay, now there's not, I wish I could just say there's one kind of enhanced efficiency nitrogen fertilizer, but there isn't. So let's, let's work through this because you're going to have choices, you're going to have uh, options to purchase different forms of nitrogen already you do, but this is going to be more and more in time. You're going to have more and more options of products. Okay, it's um, probably the biggest growth area in uh, the fertilizer um, industry is uh, coming up with new formulations of nitrogen fertilizer. Okay, so we have three classes basically. The first is called stabilized nitrogen. 
So these are products that, in effect, uh, s slow down uh, the transformations. Okay, so they slow the transformations in that nitrogen cycle. Okay, you can kind of think of it as they might keep urea longer in the soil as urea. Okay, that's why they call it kind of st stabilized. It's not stabilized forever. It's stabilized for a period of uh, a week, two weeks, three weeks, something like that. Okay, not much more than that actually. It's a bit of a delay. Okay, and we have three classes of these. One is a urease inhibitor. I'm going to give you examples of products so that becomes clearer as we move through. Okay, uh, urease inhibitor, which uh, keeps it the urea in the form of um, urea longer and prevents it from going to ammonia quickly. Another is to prevent the rapid appearance of that nitrate from the urea. That's called a nitrification inhibitor. And the second is double inhibitor where both of those are together. Okay, we have a volatilization inhibitor and a nitrification inhibitor. And the way these work are actually uh, on microbes. Okay, they work on microbes, on bacteria actually, in the soil, slowing down their functions to transform the nitrogen. Okay, so that's, that's how they're working. And they're very selective, okay? They're affecting urea for um, uh, transformation. They're affecting nitrification. They're very, very specific. It's not like we're killing bacteria generally in soil or anything like that. We're not doing anything like that at all. The next is controlled release nitrogen, which is polymer coated urea. And that's where the urea is uh, covered with a uh, plastic polymer. And the, night, the urea leaks out through the plastic as the temperature goes up and as the moisture goes up. So it's the two key things. We need temperature and moisture to have the urea come out of the plastic. Okay. And we need soil contact. If the Polymer coated urea is placed at the surface. It's useless. Okay, it's pretty much useless. It needs contact with the soil. Okay, and the third class are called uh, slow release, and these are where the urea or the nitrogen is actually formulated to not dissolve fast, um, not react fast with with soil. Okay, so they're they're quite a wide range. A lot of these are very old products. They've been developed 50, 60, 70 years ago, and they're usually offshoots of um, chemical industries that we've utilized. They're very specialty products. I'm not going to talk about those at all today. Okay. So what's happening in terms of how do these work? How controlled and slow release um, products? We have our three processes there, volatilization, nitrification, and denitrification, and colored. And this first... Um, slide shows the controlled and slow release fertilizers where I'm showing a urea granule that's yellow coated so it's going to be coated with a polymer and um, it's slowing down the transformation of that urea to go to uh, ammonia or be released as ammonia from the granule itself okay it just slows down that nothing else it's like metering out or delivering the urea nitrogen at a slower rate. Although you put it in up front and it just bleeds slowly through the granule. What causes it to bleed? What two factors? Water, moisture, the other? Temperature. And how about placement? Where do we have to place it for it to bleed? Subsurface, right? Okay, subsurface. That's not going to work as a broadcast. Okay? Good. You guys are going to pass. I have that feeling, okay? And um, the next type of product uh, is one that, that will actually now get in there and mucks around with the nitrogen transformation um, cycle and affecting bacteria uh, that um, will take urea and convert it to ammonia. And we call these urease inhibitors, okay? In the green there. And they're preventing the ammonia from showing up fast. These will work for one to three weeks, okay? 
once added to soil. They're fairly stable in the granule, but as soon as they're added to um, soil or on soil, the granule with the urease inhibitors, they become active, okay? And it's very important the concentration of the urease inhibitor that's in your product for it to be effective, okay? So the lower the concentration, you may not have um, uh, confidence in it actually preventing the ammonia from building up, okay? So you have to be careful about that, especially when you're buying these products. It's the, the concentration of the product relative to the nitrogen that's really important, okay? And then there is uh, nitrification inhibitors, and these also affect bacteria. It's a different group of bacteria and prevents them from producing uh, nitrate uh, from uh, the ammonia, and that's in the brown box and the, br the brown arrow. Now, these products work best probably in, well, not probably, they work best in soil, subsurface, okay, in soil, and they can work for um, a little bit longer than the urease inhibitor, and we're talking about two to four, maybe five weeks depending on the conditions in the soil, the soil organic matter, the clay content, and so forth, okay? So that's the window that we're looking at for them to be effective, okay? You don't want to be put in a nitrate, nitrification inhibitor for an in-season application of UAN uh, to canola or something like that, or to corn, or to potato, okay? Because it's going to delay, you're not going to have the nitrate show up and to feed your crop. Okay, now some of the products, urease inhibitor products. I guess the, 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 grand, the grand paw of the group is the Agrotane product. Okay, this is a product called NBPT. Um, it, Coke um, has, has been selling Agrotane now for quite a while. It used to be its own company called Agrotane. They bought out. And Agrotane is a product that we've, it's probably about 40, 50 years old. About 40 years old. Okay, in terms of we know. And it's a very effective urease inhibitor. And it's very um, um, effective. And there's no patent on it. So we do now have other products that have the same chemistry that are out there available. Okay. And yield, arm you, our uh, products, new products that are available with the exact same chemistry as the agrotain. The difference would be, and you'd have to look at the labels to compare the concentration of the, the NBPT active ingredient, okay? And I, my recommendation to you is to always go for the product with the highest concentration, okay? Then there are some other products. There's Lemus, which isn't quite available in, in Canada. And then there's Anvil, another Coke product, which is um, going to be on the market in about a year or two. And that is a new class of compounds, new chemistry to inhibit uh, the urease. Then there are the nitrification inhibitors, and I guess uh, the granddaddy of that is NSERV. I'm not sure some of the old timers in the audience may remember NSERV on the prairies in the early 80s with anhydrous ammonia. Um, and this in the late 70s is was becoming popular in the, the Corn Belt of the United States. NSERV is nitropyrin. It's a, a nitrification inhibitor that is probably about 80 years old in terms of its chemistry formulation, okay? And uh, associated with that is the product Entrench, which you uh, coat, uh, apply to urea, and it's nitropyrin as well, the same active ingredient, okay? These are both um, Corteva uh, products. Then there is uh, Enbound, which um, is a, a different inhibitor called DCD. And again, it's an old compound that's probably about 120 years old. It's a precursor to plastic, making plastic. It's a plasticizer. And it's extremely cheap because, you know, how much plastic we make in this world, right? So there's tons of it. I ordered it once for a study, a lab study. Um, whatever, 25 years ago, and the only thing I could buy was a big, massive barrel of the stuff, and it cost me like 15 bucks. <laughs> so it was pretty amazing, actually. 
I didn't know what to do with this whole barrel. I only needed like uh, <laughs> two grams of this stuff. Um, then there's uh, NTAC, which is a, a different product, uh, DMPP. Uh, it's not available here. It's in the United, it's in um, uh, European Union. Um, and then there is Centuro, which is a new product from Coke that uh, is, I believe, in the retailers now and available for the next growing season in, in many locations across the Paris. This is a new chemistry and it promises to be able to be tank mixed, not tank mixed, but to be uh, in tank with uh, anhydrous ammonia. Okay. Then you have these products which are the two together, double inhibitors, where we, we have uh, Super U that is on the market now with uh, NPPT and DCD, it's nitrification and urease inhibitor, arm U with the same compounds, maybe just a different uh, formulation, uh, neon with the same compounds, and then there's uh, protect N. So, oops, sorry, no, arm U does not have the exact same nitrification inhibitor as super U, it has the DMPP. So, anyway, so there's a few chemistries out there, so someday it's going to be like buying your herbicides. Okay, you're gonna have your guidebook to nitrogen fertilizers, you're gonna flip the page and say, oh, I want this, this is my soil, this is my condition, this is my crops, this is my nitrogen losses, this is what I wanna protect, okay? It's gonna get to that stage at some point. And then there's the polymer-coated urea, which is the ESN, uh, which um, um, a lot of these products are color-coded or colored, so that way you feel good when you pay the extra money for them. Okay, you say, I got something different than just regular old white uh, granular uh, urea. I'm not going to be able to talk too much about ESN at all today. So, okay, so let's start talking about the, the research with these products. So one of the things that's the advantage of um, volatilization inhibitors is to try to tackle this problem that's depicted in this cartoon where the urea granule in that white little dot dissolves in water and you can actually see this in soil, you put a urea granule on soil and then just come back to it, you'll see a little wet spot around it because it's pulling in water, okay, at the surface. And then that uh, enzymes from the bacteria will degrade the urea and produce ammonia, the pH goes up around that granule and it's in contact with the atmosphere and we're losing ammonia to the air, okay. When are we losing this? Well, we're losing it about one day after the application to the surface for the next week to two weeks, okay? That's the, basically the time period. If it doesn't rain, if it rains, then you're blessed and uh, the urea will soak into the ground and won't be lost as volatilization, okay? So this is a problem when it's at the surface. So can we slow down the formation of that ammonia so it doesn't volatilize and hopefully we get a rain then gives us delay and gives us a greater chance, a window for rain to soak it in. The other issue that um, is a concern is um, uh, that we looked into to see if it's real or not is when we band nitrogen fertilizer as a shallow band, either mid row or side row band, um, because this is becoming more common with uh, small seeded crops like canola. So around that band, there's high concentration of urea, it dissolves, the enzyme works on it, produces ammonia, the pH goes up around that band but it's close to the soil surface and therefore the ammonia can have contact with the atmosphere and go off um, to that atmosphere. At least that's the theory. And this just shows uh, that space around the band that changes with high ammonia concentrations. So we wanted to look at this to see if this is real and we wanted to look at some of these products if it's important or useful for you on the prairies. So let's look at some of the research. This is with um, five site years or five studies in uh, Manitoba with uh, canola and uh, we've looked at uh, various uh, enhanced efficiency fertilizer terms, urease inhibitors and nitrification inhibitors and we did surface placement in blue, shallow placement in that red and then green, a deep band placement of three to four inches. The shallow was a uh, quarter to one inch in depth. Okay? These were mid-row banded as well. And first thing that you see is that um, 
the surface applied urea had lower yield, about uh, five to six bushels lower of canola. And then we see this little trend of um, more yield, the deeper the placement of the canola. So it is, um, there's something going on there, and we suspect it's the urea loss. However, when we used the products, we really did not, we did not see any statistical significant differences. I'm not even going to show you the data, because we didn't see a benefit under the situation. But I want to point out something here. The placement of that nitrogen really overrode things. It made more of a difference than the formulation of the product. And you can manage and improve your nitrogen use efficiency just by the placement alone. Okay, so I want you to really remember that and keep considering that. Okay, sometimes we think we have to get really fancy, but it's really we can use our smarts and four R approaches to um, make the better use of the nitrogen. The other thing is that we shorted the canola here for nitrogen. We starved it a little bit. We only gave it 70% of recommended. So that way, if there was losses, it would show up in our yields. Because often when we do studies at recommended rates based on provincial or lab test that comes back from a nitrate test, they're already giving you a nitrogen rate that's higher than you really need because it's for insurance purposes to make sure that everybody's yield is, is not limited by nitrogen. Okay, so it's a bit higher than what you likely need for your exact field. So if we short, then we start seeing the benefits of management, in some cases, the uh, enhanced efficiency fertilizers, but that wasn't the case in this situation here. And this shows you here, when we went to the 100% or the recommended rate, there's no difference. So if somebody would do this study and say, oh, there's no difference in the placement of the fertilizer, but actually, there is, it's just that we had so much nitrogen that added, it was sufficient that we don't see the benefit of that practice, okay? And again, enhanced efficiency fertilizers in this situation didn't improve our yield um, for these five studies done in Manitoba. However, the enhanced efficiency fertilizers did have a benefit. This figure shows ammonia volatilization and the very red, the top one, shows the cumulative, so that's, as the, as the line goes up, that means more ammonia volatilized, and as it flat lines, that means it stopped being emitted, okay? It's cumulative. The red is uh, surface urea, and you can see after the first two weeks, we get uh, um, a lot of volatilization, and then it stops. So the granules are at the surface there. The super U, which has the urease inhibitor, is the next line. It's quite a difference there. Huh? And it's because it's preventing the ammonia from showing up and therefore volatilizing. And then um, we didn't get a, a good rainfall. If we had gotten a good rainfall, I don't think the super U would have kept rising over time. If we had a good rainfall after two weeks, it would have soaked into the ground and then we wouldn't have had uh, any more volatilization and would have really worked effectively in reducing uh, ammonia. The next is shallow banding, so a quarter of an inch below, and there's really no difference between the Super U and the urea. Okay? So as soon as the product is below the soil, it doesn't matter. A urease inhibitor is not going to help you uh, with um, uh, ammonia. Actually, you don't, even need, you don't need a urease inhibitor if you subsurface place your nitrogen. You're wasting your money if you do. Okay? And then if we deep band the urea three to four inches, we get no ammonia coming off the soil. It's as, it's as if we added no nitrogen, same amount of volatilization. Pretty incredible just by going deep into the soil. Okay. So that's pretty neat. You don't need to pick up a, uh, a, a formulated fertilizer. You can just do your um, placement with your um, seeder. So the next question is, uh, well, how about in the fall? If I, I want to float my nitrogen on in the fall, my urea on, but I hear that I'm going to lose lots of urea, uh, ammonia, so therefore I'm going to put a urease inhibitor I can float in the fall, and I don't have to worry about the springtime, I can just seed, okay? 
Well, let's see what happens. This is what we did to two studies in Manitoba. The blue is surface fall applied urea left at the surface, and A is uh, at planting, we put it on at the surface. And we use the different enhanced efficiency fertilizer products um, in terms of the urease inhibitors and, and nitrification inhibitor, and there was no difference. Those products didn't help. Um, the thing that made the big difference was just the timing of the application, okay? Now, keep in mind, so clearly this is what uh, we're looking at about almost 15 bushels difference, okay, in canola. And it's because the fall applied fertilizer with, a, with an okay snow um, bank um, basically dissolved and was washed off the field in Manitoba when you have a frozen soil and melting of that snow, right? It's gone. You can have an inhibitor of whatever, um, but it's going to wash away. The fertilizer is going to wash away, okay? So um, it's not a practice that I would recommend. Fall application, I would recommend subsurface placed and as late as possible in the year. Apply after the second week of October. Okay, and a subsurface place, and the deeper, the better. Okay, I don't think these products are going to help us to be able to float in the fall. Okay. Um, okay, which I showed you before about how they can reduce ammonia, which is which is excellent. Uh, ammonia is is a big problem for um, the environment, uh, and, and um, because they do slow down ammonia loss or reduce it, uh, that might be saving you money. And we just, I guess you need, we need 20, 30 pounds of nitrogen being lost as ammonia and, uh, and to really show up as yield, and I quite don't have those in my studies in terms of that amount of loss. How about for nitrous oxide, that potent greenhouse gas that we get our fingers pointed at? Well, here's <coughs> a summary of five studies in Manitoba where we looked at urea and super U, so that uh, double inhibited uh, urea product, and we um, broadcast, incorporated it, we uh, side banded, and we deep banded. These are, um, sorry, deep banded, sorry, I mean shallow banded and, and deep banded. And the first thing you see is that that big spike there, the tallest one is the urea that's shallow banded. It had the greatest amount of. N2O loss, but the deeper band um, didn't uh, had much less. It was same as the the broadcast incorporated. Uh, but then when you see the where I put the circle, the green circle, that is the super U, is very effective in reducing nitrous oxide emissions, N2O emissions. Okay, regardless of the placement. And that's the thing about nitrification inhibitors; they're darn effective in reducing N2O losses from soil. Now let's move to in season. We're getting more corn growing in our in uh, southern Manitoba, grain corn. Uh, you grow uh, grain corn here as well. And we have uh, canola growers that are interested in in season uh, top or side dressing of um, canola. So we're doing studies with that, with these inhibitors. Now UAN is the product of choice, urea ammonium uh, nitrate. And here's a study looking at the ammonia losses with different products. So we have UAN, that's dribble, uh, top, top dress uh, dribble, um, surface banded onto uh, in season, onto the canola. And you can see the ammonia loss is greatest in blue there. We add uh, two uh, UAN agrotain plus so that's uh, nitrification and urease inhibitor to the UAN. Uh, dribble it on, and we get less ammonia volatilization. UAN with agrotain, just agrotain alone, which is the urease inhibitor alone, we get basically half the amount of ammonia loss than as just straight UAN. It's very effective in reducing uh, those losses. So if those losses are agronomically important, it should translate, and we're not um, overshooting our N application rate, 
we should see a benefit to the product, okay? If you want to see a, a benefit to this product, you'll have to probably reduce your rates of nitrogen, okay? Then it'll show up. So in season, these products can be very helpful as for top dressing, okay? Here's um, with, with um, uh, corn and UAN top dressing versus uh, side dressing, shallow side dressing versus deep side dressing. You can see with top dressing, the UAN, we got the most emissions, but as soon as we side dress and get that UAN into the soil, it's the same thing as granular urea, it stops ammonia volatilization dead in its tracks. Okay? So, um, bit more of a pain to side dress than to top dress, of course. Um, but if you have the ability to uh, side dress, you can do that with um, no concern for volatilization. You wouldn't need a, an enhanced efficiency fertilizer and pay for the premium. Now, let's continue with uh, uh, nitrous oxide now, uh, greenhouse gas. And here's a study with various parameters that we measured in a study. This is eight, eight studies in, um, well, no, uh, six in Manitoba and two in um, Saskatchewan. And the red box, those two uh, bars are much smaller than the others, right? You'd agree with me on that? And those bars are super U and entrench, which are nitrification inhibitors. So the super U and entrench, which are nitrification inhibitors, are very effective in reducing N2O emissions. They're very consistent as well. There's very few times when I'm doing studies that I see something that's consistent in the field. And these products are very consistent. Okay? The other thing I like to point out is all my studies that I'm showing you here are done on commercial farm fields. I, I, I don't do studies on research plots at the university. I only work on farmer's fields because I find um, there's lower residual nitrates. I get nitrogen response to fertilizer and um, the management is just far superior in terms of residue management and I don't have wonky mineralizations and releases of nitrogen. So we work on uh, farmer's fields. Okay, now wrapping up. How to use enhanced efficiency fertilizers? Well, the first thing is actually not even anything to do about enhanced efficiency fertilizers and go to our four R's, which is what? The right, Right to what? There's four of them. I'm not going to let you out of here until you, I hear them. Rate, timing, source. Pardon? The formulation, the source, okay? Placement, okay? Let's consider those. You can put, put other things in like rotation and other, other things, okay? So we've got to think about those. And timing and placement have a massive impact on yields and losses of nitrogen, grain yields and nitrogen losses. First and foremost, we really do have to consider those. And also the, the rate, as I was saying to you, if you don't change your rate and you're using enhanced efficiency fertilizers, you're probably missing the boat here. Okay, they're supposed to help you improve getting nitrogen into the crop and if you're using a high rate which is set with urea and it's meant that most growers will not be limited by nitrogen, we're, we're not using it properly, okay? We're not using its definition of improved nitrogen use, okay? Now where one must apply granular urea or UAN to surfaces, ammonia volatilization inhibitors will reduce losses of the ammonia. That's for certain. Now, will that reduction in losses of ammonia show up as a yield benefit? That's the uncertainty. They will work, but will they give you a yield benefit? It depends on how much loss of the nitrogen occurred. Okay? And you're probably going to need something like 20 to 30 pounds of nitrogen to be lost. And that's going to be challenging probably often to get. We can get that, but uh, we'll need really warm, windy conditions uh, for that to happen and not a good soaking rain. The worst scenario where you get like a, a tenth of an inch of rain, just enough to moisten the surface or you get good dews in the morning, that's the worst case scenario because then you'll get ammonia volatilization without 
good rainfall to soak in the nitrogen into the soil. Okay? The chance of seeing a yield benefit is likely uh, unattainable unless you reduce or change your rates of the nitrogen fertilizer. Okay? I get a lot of um, flack for saying this. But um, in our studies, it's only when we, re we reduce the, really the nitrogen rates that we do see the benefit from these products. Okay, continuing. Nitropyrin and DCD, these are nitrification inhibitors, do effectively slow nitrification of granular urea. Okay, they, they do work. Now, are they gonna show up as a yield benefit to you is the uncertainty. And that depends during that time of, between that time of application and when crop N is really kicks in gear, do we have losses of nitrogen? Particularly in this case, it's gonna be from very uh, heavy rains that are gonna cause leaching or denitrification, they're gonna saturate the soil. So we're gonna need saturated soil conditions for these products really to, to show up. But they can show up and, as, as a benefit, okay? Um, these products are effective as a subsurface placed urea, okay? And I should mention the urease inhibitors are only effective uh, or only needed when we're applying at the surface, okay? We've not been able to get nitropyrin, which is NSERV, to work with anhydrous ammonia. Now we're doing a, uh, with a sidekick unit, we're, we're pumping in the nitropyrin into the ammonia condensate stream before it gets injected. So we may have a problem with the delivery. I don't want to say that there's, I know the compound does work because it works with entrench as a additive to granule urea. So I know it works, but why can't we get it to work with anhydrous ammonia? And I'm defaulting to the fact it's our delivery system is problematic. It probably needs to be tanked, put into the tank, okay? But it's a bit corrosive, the nitropyrin, and if you have an old tank, um, most people don't like to add, um, a corrosive product to an old tank because it just causes you <laughs> hours and hours of grief, right? Um, with, with clogged lines and so forth. Okay, the new nitrification inhibitors, DMPP, and another one that we've been working with that I haven't shown you here, DMPSA, also re reduce nitrification rates. So this is a really a bright light in the horizon for nitrogen management that these products really do work in slowing down nitrification. And they're extremely effective in reducing N2O emissions. And you're going to hear more about this as of an avenue moving forward to reducing N2O emissions or greenhouse gases from agriculture. And one of the discussion points is can we be using these products um, uh, to our benefit in terms of um, claiming carbon credits and reductions of, of gases to recoup the premium costs. Now, what are the premium costs? Uh, it's about uh, urease inhibitors are about nine cents a pound of nitrogen and uh, uh, nitrification inhibitors and ESN are a, a bit more, uh, 11 to 12 ESN is probably 13, 14 cents, okay? So that, um, they're not cheap, okay? But uh, they, they do work, but the question is in yields, uh, you're gonna need a good amount of nitrogen losses for them to be effective. So I have lots of people to thank, uh, a lot of graduate students, a lot of uh, colleagues, my colleague uh, Don Flayton, uh, soil fertility expert with me at the University of Manitoba, a lot of uh, companies like Coke Industries, Nutrien, for support for Research Fertilizer Canada as well, our research is supported by the fertilizer industry, they're really into the environmental and agronomic benefits of, of these products. And I urge you to follow us on Twitter um, at the handle at Soul Ecology U Manitoba. With that, thank you very much for your attention. Any questions for Mario? Thank you very much. Excellent. Mario, summarizing, it, it sure looks like from a economic point of view, these may not make sense for producers most of the time, do you expect policy changes to support their use because of the environmental benefits? <laughs> First, I don't like to comment on policy because I'm a researcher <laughs> and not a policy maker. So um, and if I, every time I've commented on policy, uh, 
somebody, lots of people get mad at me <laughs> if I used to talk about the direction of things. Um, there, there is pressure for um, policy um, incentives to encourage a uh, loss, a uh, reduction in losses of nitrogen, particularly the nitrous oxide. So I think if things keep going the way they're going, in about 10 to 15 years, 10 to 15 years, um, uh, enhanced efficiency fertilizers will be your de facto nitrogen fertilizer source. Because uh, the companies will retool their manufacturing plants to not have urea as the product output, but rather have the enhanced efficiency fertilizer products as the major output. And when that happens, you have the economies of scale of production and the price drops down. To produce more than one stream of some of these products is a headache for them. They'd rather just be producing. I'm talking about the large, the, the manufacturers that make the nitrogen themselves, um, like, um, like Coke and Yara and so forth like that. It's a little sad, though, to be adding cost to the product when you can solve the same problems with proper placement. Uh, yes. Um, well, I don't find it sad. I find it phenomenal how our decisions that we make um, can be simple or seem simple and so effective. And these are things that we've been saying through research and extending through extension and saying these are best management practices, such as deep band placement, which on the prairies for phosphorus and for nitrogen is recommended. But we're moving more and more to floating of nitrogen on the surface, getting custom applicators in, going in, floating because it's wet conditions, and um, that's when we're gonna have lateralization losses. And then we have small seeded crops that make it more difficult to, to be doing banding at the same time. And we even heard about it today, a lot of planters and seeders are focusing on that precision for the seed rather than for the flexibility of fertilizer delivery, which I think is gonna change as well. We're gonna start seeing more and more precision planters and seeders with the ability for two sources of fertilizer that'll be in row, side, mid, up and down, all over the place. What do you consider deep banded? What, uh, three to four inches. Three to four inches? Or does it just have to get into moisture or does it actually have to be three to four inches? That's when you, if you're doing mid row banding, for instance, boy, when you suck that in three to four inches, it is throwing a lot of dirt around on a mid row bander. Whereas, you know, that's not the preferred. Uh, I, and a lot of people I don't think are going that deep. Yeah, so the, the work that was done in the 70s and 80s were based on about three inches down uh, and three to four. And uh, we find with ammonia volatilization and these losses, that's the sweet spot. As soon as you get down there, it's good. It's a good point about the moisture. So we need, we need a, a depth of soil to cover where the fertilizer is placed so that the ammonia can get in contact with the soil and the moisture and be bound and prevented from reaching the surface as ammonia and then going up to the atmosphere. So that's the really cre thing, critical thing. So we do need moisture, you're correct. If we're going into dry soil, then you should be banding deeper in, into dry, of course. And, um, and we know with anhydrous ammonia, everybody uh, goes deep because we know it's a gas and you're gonna have to do that. And if you're on a sandy soil or lighter textured soils, you go a lot deeper to get it that distance more. So water and contact with silts and clays can be affected. Questions for Mario? Yes, sir. Everybody hear the question, in terms of nitrous oxide going up in the air, how much is returned to the land in rainfall? Good question. Um, very little. Almost none for nitrous oxide, because nitrous oxide in the upper atmosphere will stick around for a long time and uh, like decades and decades and won't react, okay? Now the ammonia that goes up into the atmosphere is a different story. The ammonia that goes up into the atmosphere, a, a small portion of it will turn into nitrous oxide and therefore ammonia is a greenhouse gas because of that nitrous oxide that's produced and that's be because of um, very high up there, there's different kinds of radiation, and it causes, and with ozone, and causes a reaction to produce N2O. 
but um, a good portion of the ammonia will rain down back on the surface either as uh, acid rain or as uh, dissolved ammonia. The problem is you can't predict where it's going to fall. So generally we think our background of ammonia deposition from the atmosphere is about uh, three pounds of N per acre background. Whereas now we're pushing uh, in the tens. If you're close to the feedlots and so forth like that, you're going to be way higher than that. You're going to be getting uh, a sizable amount of uh, free nitrogen that you can actually pocket, uh, which is pretty excellent. And when we go in um, the Netherlands and areas of high livestock concentration in Europe, there's actually bans on no fertilizer nitrogen allowed because there's enough nitrogen that comes down in the atmosphere because of the, lives, intensive, uh, the density of the livestock production. So the ammonia is the one that rains down, that comes back down more so than the N2O. The N2O is very persistent in the atmosphere. So you can get a bill from the feedlot next door. <laughs> Great question. Other questions for Mario before we, we break for lunch? Anything? Once, twice? Mario, thank you very much. Let's have a round of applause for a great thank presentation, you. Mario.